Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Naomi Klein. Klein is an award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, filmmaker, and author of the international bestsellers No Logo, Taking Aim at the Brand Bullies, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, and most recently, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate. Klein gave a talk based on This Changes Everything at the University of Oregon on February 16th, 2016 as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2015-16 Cressman Lecturer. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Happy to be with you. Although your prior writing uh, has always been concerned with questions of social justice, the climate crisis hasn't been a major focus of your work before now. Indeed, in the introduction to This Changes Everything, you explain that you denied climate change for longer than you'd like to admit. What changed for you and why? Well, well, first of all, I should be clear that when I say denied climate change, I'm not talking about denying the reality, uh, you know, the scientific reality. I, I'm more referring to the sort of soft denialism that we all engage in, where we just give ourselves permission to look away. And I think there are lots of ways of looking away. And, and for me, my way of looking away was saying, um, well, look, um, you know, there's lots of well-funded green groups out there. They're dealing with this. I'm dealing with more pressing issues. Climate change is way off in the future. This is one issue I don't have to care about. And I, you know, I, my, my work previously was, was more around economic justice and, and, um, and, and human rights and labor rights. And so, you know, we all have really full plates. Um, and, and so what changed for me was, was Katrina, was Hurricane Katrina 10 years ago. Um, I was working on my previous book. Uh, I was working on the shock doctrine and I went to New Orleans in the midst of that disaster. The city was still underwater when I was there. And, you know, Katrina was so clearly not just about the weather. It was, it was the intersection of the kind of extreme weather we are seeing more of in the context of climate change. You know, warming oceans lead to stronger storms, and Katrina was a very strong storm. But what really turned it into a catastrophe in New Orleans was the intersection of that extreme weather with the legacy of four decades of neglect of the public sphere. Uh, and that, ha that was my wheelhouse. That, that, you know, that's, that's what the shock auction was about, how we ended up with this extreme form of capitalism that has been systematically attacking everything public, everything collective, um, you know, since uh, Reagan and Thatcher. So, um, so that was my wake up call of, of, you know, wait a minute, you know, we have a system that's gonna produce more and more shocks, um, economic shocks, military shocks, but also weather shocks as, as the world warms. And you know, the subject of my last book was about how each one of those shocks becomes opportunities to further privatize the public sphere unless there's a counter strategy. And that's what this changes everything is about is, okay, what would be a progressive people's shock in the face of the climate crisis? So this changes everything. Help us understand how it changes everything. Right, so the this is climate change. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I called the book uh, that because, you know, we, we, when we talk about climate change at this point in history, after we have failed to act for so long and indeed made the problem so much worse, you know, since governments started meeting about lowering emissions, global emissions have gone up by 60%. So, you know, this crisis doesn't stay static as you make the problem worse. So, you know, when, when, you know, if we had acted in a timely manner in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when the first government meetings were happening and the you know, UN Climate Convention was signed, there could have been more sort of incrementalist responses, but we didn't do that. And so now we face a series of radical choices. Either everything changes about our physical world, and that's the road we're on. We're on a road towards a very radical physical future. We're on a road that leads to four degrees warming or even more, four degrees Celsius of warming. And you know, in the book I quote um, Kevin Anderson, who is a leading climate scientist in England, who says that's not compatible with anything we would describe as an organized society. Um, <clears throat> so that's one version of this changes everything. And another version of everything, it cha this changes everything, is we swerve off that dangerous road. Um, but in order to do so, 
because we've waited so long, we now need to change pretty much everything about our political and economic system. We need to get money out of politics in a serious way. We need to completely reimagine the, the rules of trade between countries so that we're able to relocalize our economies and use less fossil fuels. We need to change our agriculture system. Um, and we also need to challenge this ideological project, uh, the Reagan-Thatcher project of neoliberalism, which, has, which, which sees no role for, for collective action because climate change is the essence of a collective crisis. It requires huge investments in the public sphere so that we change the, our transportation systems, our energy systems, big investments. The money needs to come from somewhere, so we're going to have to raise taxes. We're going to have to break all of these um, sort of market taboos if we're going to deal, deal with this seriously. And one of the taboos we, also, we need to confront is the taboo around the quest for economic growth. Uh, and you know that's the biggest one of all. And uh, that's why I called the book Capital, the subtitle is Capitalism Versus the Climate, because that quest for economic growth is at the center of you know, the capitalist economy. Growth, perpetual, that's what capitalism re re amounts to. You have to keep growing or capitalism isn't working. Well, the, the definition of a crisis within our current economic system is the absence of so growth. growth. Um, so, you know, if you, if that happens for a short time, it's a recession. If it happens for a long time, it's a depression. So we don't, you know, that we don't want a great depression. Um, we want a great transition. So it has to be planned, and that's another taboo that we have. You know, economic planning fell out of fashion. Um, you know, was uh, seen as sort of quasi-communist. But you're not going to change the building blocks of an industrial economy, and we are talking about the building box, we're talking about energy and transportation and urban planning without some planning. So what does this new economy look like that you're imagining? Okay, so we do this swerve, we do this yeah. transition. What is, it, what is it like? What's that world like that you imagine? Um, well, you know, for me, it's really key that, w that when we talk about a transition, we're talking about a just transition because we live in a time of multiple overlapping crises. And, you know, a lot of them are, are coming to a head right now, right? Um, we have a crisis of inequality, uh, and more and more people are realizing this, and I think this is why there's so much momentum behind Bernie Sanders' campaign. Um, the, you know, the work of Thomas Piketty, you know, rocked the economic world because the promise of trickle-down has failed. The money stayed at the top, you know? And so people realize this. So for me, what the future looks like is solving multiple problems at once. You know, sometimes when you talk to environmentalists, they're like, no, first we have to solve climate change because if we don't solve climate change, nothing else has a chance, right? You hear slogans like there are no, no, no jobs on a dead planet. And that's true, but it's not actually a winning strategy. A winning strategy is to say, and, you know, and, and this is the sort of work that I've been doing um, in Canada where I live, is, um, how, is we can lower our emissions in line with what scientists are telling us we need to do while creating huge numbers of jobs that pay a living wage. Um, and we can do it in a way that systematically reduces inequality, including inequalities that date back to our country's founding. Um, so we can systematically um, uh, make sure that as we transition to the post-carbon economy, as we move from fossil fuels to renewable energy, that the communities that have been on the front lines of the extractive economy, indigenous communities, communities of color, particularly a African American communities in this country, you know, the Flint disaster, water disaster reminds us that the bodies of black people in this country have borne the the the, the brunt of the of the pollution associated with our industrial economy. Those communities should be first in line to receive the public funds to own and control their own renewable energy projects, efficiency projects, local agriculture projects. A lot of this is happening at a grassroots level. You can point to it in places like Detroit where there's an amazing uh, um, you know, food justice movement, um, but it isn't being supported by policy in a meaningful way. So that's what the future looks like to me is how do we solve, we figure out a way to solve multiple problems at once. Inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, um, you know, and, and we bring down our emissions very, very quickly. I'm an English professor, so for me one of the really interesting things about your argument is that you claim that one of the things we have to change is the stories that we tell ourselves mm -hmm. about the economy and about our future. Why is that crucial in your account? Well, you know, growth is a story. Um, uh, the progress is a story. And, and we have been living inside a story that told us that the, the, that, that the 
Earth, Earth was infinite. And I think that these stories are particularly powerful in countries that um, are sort of sometimes referred to as settler colonial countries, right? So-called newer countries where Europeans came uh, to the United States, to Canada, to Australia, and went, wow, this place is huge. It seems to go on forever. There's so many trees. There's just, you know, we could exhaust this. We could take and take and take and never run out. So these are, um, you know, even though these ideas date back to Europe in the 1600s with Rene Descartes talking about, you know, how man can be masters and possessors of nature and the whole scientific revolution, um, which, which this idea that, that nature can be completely dominant dominated and, and, and known, um, that, that where they really played out most was in the so-called new world. Um, so that's the story we're in. We're in that story. And that's the story we need to change because, um, you know, and that story has a lot to do with fossil fuels, even though it predates fossil fuels. The way I, you know, the way I, the way I think of it is um, you, had, you, had, you had a story, you, you had actually a couple stories. One was in the Bible. <laughs> you know, one was the story of dominion, the idea of the earth being given to us to use. Um, and obviously there are big you know, debates um, uh, within Christianity about whether that is being misinterpreted. We now have a Pope, uh, Pope Francis, saying that the doctrine of dominion has been misconstrued and in fact, uh, man does not have a right to dominate nature, but that's a very powerful story. That, that it's a, and it's a story of apartness. It's a story of apartness from nature, not um, uh, you know, that, that we are living within a living system and a community of living beings, which is the story before that story that most, that existed in most parts of the world and that still exists mm -hmm. in many parts of the world and has been kept alive by indigenous people um, in, in North America and around the world. Um, so, so that story intersects with the scientific revolution where we're all going like, oh my God, we, we're figuring out everything. All, I, we'll, eventually we'll know absolutely everything there is to be known. We are as gods, with, and, and that's just a theory until along comes fossil fuels, and it seems to actually give us the power of gods, because suddenly ships can sail in any weather, you don't have to wait for the wind to blow, suddenly factories can go 24-7, It doesn't, and you can build them anywhere because you have this, this kind of energy that seems to separate you from nature, right? You used to have to build your factory where there was a waterfall, rushing water, so you were in a di dialogue, in a dialectic with nature. Um, so fossil fuels seems to free human beings from that dialogue. And then along comes climate change going, uh-uh. <laughs> Every action has a reaction. All this time that you've been, you've been telling yourself that you were a part, you were emitting this substance into the atmosphere that has been accumulating and accumulating relentlessly. And now comes the response. And the response, like, you know, Hurricane Sandy, you know, or Katrina, and um, can make people who m fancy themselves masters of the universe feel pretty puny. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most powerful aspects of the book is the stories that you share about um, groups of activists on the front lines of the climate change crisis. Tell us about one or two of those groups and what, what, what they taught you, what you learned from them. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's so many, and, and you know, I, I use this phrase blockadia, which comes out of the, the, the battle against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, but you know, we're here in Eugene, and you know, I think Eugene, in Eugene, people sort of, they're like, we invented blockadia, you know, in the war in the woods, and you know, moving, you know, all the tree sits, and, the, and, 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 and these are tactics that are being used now to stop pipelines and, and, and um, oil by rail. In the book, I make the argument that, you know, actually Eugene doesn't get the full credit. Like maybe we should give it to the Ogoni in Nigeria who like fought back shell and so on. But obviously this is a global phenomenon. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, for me, because I live in Canada and, and the, I, I guess, I guess the, the movement that I feel most connected to is, um, um, you know, it has to do with the tar sands and these pipelines that they, you know, not the Keystone pipeline, but the pipelines that they are trying to build across Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was writing the book, I was living in British Columbia, which is where my family lives. And, um, and there was a, just this amazing movement to stop the Northern Gateway Pipeline, Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline. And, I mean, it's just this absurd project that they want to build this pipeline through some of the most pristine boreal forest. Um, and, and, um, all of these indigenous communities came together and s signed something called the Fraser Declaration, saying we will not let any tar sands pipeline pass through our territory. We will be an unmovable wall. Um, and 
you know, that I, I guess I guess that struggle um, I, I feel is you know was transformative for me because I feel like it was it was the moment where non-indigenous Canadians really got that indigenous rights are not in competition with our way of life with you know with with what we cherish and 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 because because the way in which the story had so often been told is like okay native people are fishing or logging or you know exercising their territorial rights and that is somehow taking away from other people who want to do other things on, the, on that, that territory and in fact what we saw with the pipeline battles is by exercising their their land rights and protecting their treaty rights or the, their 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 unceded land rights in the in the case of British Columbia, which is largely untreated, um, that's our best chance of protecting what we cherish. You know, the, the the places we cherish, the water we depend on, and the planet. Um, and and so these amazing new alliances were built. And and so I I, I guess. I, I would just at uh, just one example um, it, I think that that's and I think it, very much the spirit of a lot of the resistance in the Pacific Northwest you've just made an argument uh, implicitly about the importance of collective action uh, alliances across groups one of the aspects of the book that's surprising uh, to some is is uh, your argument that the time for individual action is past. It's too late for that. And now this kind of large scale collective action across uh, boundaries, alliances of various sorts are necessary. Explain the logic. So it's, I, wouldn't put, I wouldn't say that the time for individual action is past. Um, but I would say that the time where you know, we go from here's the climate crisis to change your light bulb, bike to work, um, you know, these individual lifestyle changes that you can make, you know, stop eating meat, um, you know, all of that important good, you'll be happier and healthier for it. Um, but that will not add up to the kinds of changes that we need. And, but the truth is, I don't think it ever, it ever would have. Um, and, and I think that the, the focus in the sort of first phase of the climate movement on uh, going from this global systemic crisis you know the building blocks of our economy are um, you know are on a collision course with with life on earth to here's what you as an individual can do was a symptom of the triumph of market logic in the sense that that is that is actually a bizarre logical leap to go from a huge um, collective problem to very small individual actions you know the history of social change if you look at the way you know, in most parts of the world, when, when people identify a very big problem, they don't immediately go to what is the one small thing that I can do. They at go to what can we do together? Like if we're up against a really big problem, we need to work together. We need to organize our workplaces. Um, you know, we need to organize our neighborhoods. And yeah, the individual actions do matter, but there's no illusion that you as one small individual are going to, um, you know, ha have an impact on the global you know, planetary systems, you know? And so, um, you know, I see that as a symptom of the sort of triumph of individualism as a, a, and uh, I don't think it was ever gonna get us there and now people realize that. So it's more important to fight for better transit so everybody has that option, you know, because the truth is, is not everybody can bike to work. Not everybody can take transit to work. Um, you know, and not, like we have utilities with monopolies in most markets. So even if you wanted to have renewable energy, you can't have it. So we have to engage with policy. Um, this isn't to say that those individual actions don't matter. They do and we need to talk about them, but I, I'm kind of course correcting here because I think we spend a lot of time on those individual um, on those individual responses and that it's ultimately disempowering because people made a lot of those changes, right? And they started composting and recycling and biking and using transit. They're like, wait a minute, emissions are still going up. And that's because we weren't looking at systems and we weren't going after the big polluters. So uh, this is a leap year. This is the month of February. Yes. The leap day is coming. You are now involved with a new movement called the Leap Manifesto. What is the Leap Manifesto? So the Leap Manifesto comes out of a meeting that our team, or their, this Changes Everything team, hosted um, last May. And we hosted it because um, 
well, we were in the middle of an election in Canada, or we were about to start an election in Canada, and none of the major political parties were talking about climate change in any way that li lined up with the science. Specifically, um, you know, even our third party, our, the NDP, was not willing to say hard truths about the fact that we need we need a moratorium on tar sands expansion. You know, we and we need to start winding it down. We need to keep that carbon in the ground. This is what the sci scientific community is telling us. But they just wouldn't go there, right? So they would say some nice things about climate change, but um, you know, they weren't they weren't they weren't saying the hard things. So we hosted this meeting and we brought together a really. Um, um, amazingly broad cross-section of social movements from uh, you know food justice faith groups women's groups climate obviously um, labor including the trade union that represents workers in the tar sands you know so, something about being in Canada like we're able it's a little easier for us to do this kind of broad-based organizing um, because there's fewer people or something like that and not to say it was perfect by any means there were people who should have been in the room who weren't there but it was it was still pretty amazing and and so we, we came up with this document that is sort of a blueprint for what a justice-based transition off of fossil fuels would be. So we start with the science. We have to get, you know, we, we have to do this quickly. We need to be look, getting our emissions down by about 10% of a year. We start also with the technology, the fact that we could get to 100% renewable energy um, in two decades for, en for electricity and by mid-century for everything. This is the research we have out of Stanford, so let's do it. And then going from there, the science and the technology, we say, okay, how do we do it in a way that, um, you know, that, that deals with indigenous rights and migrant rights and brings as many people as possible to the table? So that's what the Leap Manifesto is. And um, you know, it was great because in, in, during an election like ours, it's a it was a little bit like when you guys were getting rid of Bush, right? Where it was sort of like we were very clear on what we, we, we did not want to reelect um, our very right wing government that, that we've had now for, um, we'd had for the better part of a decade. Um, so it was very much a vote for what you don't want election. And so we wanted to give people something that they could say, that, that they did want, because the political parties weren't giving people something in inspiring. So that's what the Leap Manifesto was. And now people are writing their own Leap Manifestos. <coughs> in Australia, in Nunavut. We just got an email from some folks in the Bronx who are organizing events on, people are organizing events on Leap Day. And, you know, for me as a writer, and, you know, I know you're interested in a narrative, like, I got really excited when I realized that it was a leap year because leap years are a great metaphor um, because we change our human-created systems every, you know, our calendar, right, how we measure time. It does not actually sync up with the Earth's revolution around the sun. And it actually is easier to change our rules than it is to change the laws of nature. Um, and, you know, I start my book with this great quote from Kim Stanley Robinson, the wonderful science fiction writer, um, saying, you know, talking about how he has imagined all kinds of wild things in his books, like damming the glaciers and, um, you know, seeding the oceans. And he says, and hardest of all, comprehensively reimagining re capitalism, right? Because it's actually harder right now for people to imagine changing the rules of our economy than it is for them to imagine, you know, blocking the sun, um, you know, or fertilizing the oceans. Geoengineering is treated as a more serious solution than changing capitalism. That's backwards. Uh, and so, we like the leap as a metaphor because it, it shows that actually we, it's easier to change our human created systems than it is to change the laws of nature. Earlier you mentioned the Pope. You describe yourself as a secular Jewish feminist, but you were invited last summer to speak at the Vatican as part of a press conference uh, around the Pope's encyclical on climate change. Tell us about that experience and why you agreed to do that. <laughs> it was definitely, um, one of the strangest experiences of my life. <laughs> um, and it was, so, it was, I mean, I don't know how to describe it really. Um, I think in some ways it was weirder for the people who really are immersed in that culture than it was for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I wrote in my text that I, that I, w I described myself a as, a, as a secular Jewish feminist and the Pope spokesperson who was moderating the panel said to me, is this how you describe yourself? And I said, well, yeah, it's like right there. I put it, that's the way I put it. But I didn't understand what he was asking because he was what he was saying is, is this the way you want me to introduce you? And it never would have occurred to me to ask him to introduce me as a secular Jewish feminist, but he did. He uh -huh. stood up there at the dais and said, you know, and Naomi Klein is a secular Jewish feminist. And I didn't think anything of it, but afterwards this, um, 
this journalist who's been covering the Vatican for 20 years, she said, I, I thought I would die. I never thought I would hear the word <laughs> feminist come out of that man's mouth in this room, you know? So I, it was a funny, so in a funny way, it was just sort of like, because this is so not my world, I didn't realize um, just how radical it was. But I, I did learn more and more, at, you know, the, the more I talked to people who had been very much outsiders within Catholicism and were suddenly finding themselves invited to the center of the center of power, right? And um, I guess the main thing I took away from it was that this pope, um, flaws and all, um, and, and, you know, there's, like, obviously, like, there's, there, there, there are many, many things that need changing. Um, it, you know, is modeling a kind of leadership that I think is commensurate to the crisis. You know, this is, this is, this is a man in a hurry, in a really big hurry. He is trying to leap. He is trying to drag this ancient institution um, at, 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 at incredible speed on every front, you know, you just watch him. And so I, I, the main thing I took away from it was, wow, if the Vatican can change that quickly, what's our excuse? <laughs> yeah, excellent. So we have a couple of minutes left. This probably will be the last question. Part of the book paints a very dire picture, but it's not a bleak book, and you're clearly not a nihilist. You're obviously a person who has a lot of optimism. How do you how do you maintain that positive attitude given everything that you've learned, all the incredible research mm -hmm. you did? How do you you're sitting here smiling? And <laughs> how do you do that? How, what um, keeps you positive? Well, I think I think a lot of it has to do with you know having having seen rapid change. Um, and, and, and knowing that it's always a surprise, like when it happens, it's always a surprise. A really transformative moment for me was being in Argentina in um, uh, 2002, right after their economy collapsed. And there was just, you know, they went through five presidents in three weeks and there was this huge wave of factory takeovers where factories turned into workers co-ops and there were hundreds of neighborhood assemblies and they were just reimagining how their country worked. And, I mean, what, what's so striking when you're witnessing something like that is that it's a surprise to everybody involved, right? Nobody predicted it. Even the people who, or, who supposedly organized it would never have imagined, because they were just doing what they were doing before, right? And then suddenly, suddenly everyone, right? Suddenly everyone shows up. And, and so I think that we've, ha we've seen a few of those moments. Um, you know, Occupy was sort of like that. Um, and, and I think we're seeing the reverberations of Occupy and the Sanders campaign. Nobody could have predicted the Sanders campaign. Nobody could have predicted Pope Francis. So you've got to be ready for these moments. And I think what, the sh what my research with, with the shock doctrine taught me is um, there's an incredible moral imperative to be ready for moments of crisis, moments of shock. Because if you're not ready, then then there will be others who will exploit that moment and they will do it in ways that are deeply anti-democratic and they will leave us with a far more unequal society than we have right now, as unequal as it is. Thank you for that. I have to stop you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with award-winning journalist Naomi Klein. She's the author of This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. Klein gave a talk based on her book at the University of Oregon on February 16, 2016, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2015-16 Cressman Lecturer. Thanks so much for watching.